Hi, folks. I think we are live uh, uh, for our uh, presentation today. Uh, thanks so much for um, joining this special event from Fair Vote. Um, we're going to highlight today this year's progress for, for fair elections and methods and ranked choice voting from Utah to New York City, Virginia, and the halls of Congress. Uh, my name is Rob Ritchie. I'm president and CEO of Fair Vote. Um, which is an electoral reform organization that's a national leader on ranked choice voting in the Fair Representation Act. Um, I've been with Fair Vote since we started way back in 1992, and our work has never seemed as compelling nor as promising for what we can achieve today. As we confront the bitter polarization in Congress and increasingly among voters themselves, big changes are needed to change incentives in elections by breaking out of binary choices and winner take all politics. Um, we're going to uh, uh, be looking for your questions today, but they're going to be ones where we're using the Q&A feature. So if anyone um, doesn't answer a question for you today, you can always email info at fairboat.org, where we'll have a staffer ready to answer questions offline. Uh, we tend to receive a lot of questions in these, these events, so helpful tips to make sure your question is more likely to be answered is make your question relate to the topic. Uh, we're more likely to answer questions that apply to advocates across the country rather than a specific state or geography. And short questions are almost always easier for others to understand. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, with Congressman uh, Richie Torres, um, who and um, uh, also leading Utah reformers and leaders from Fair Vote. Uh, the House this year passed legislation that would boost ranked choice voting. Utah has more than doubled the number of cities with mayors elected by RCV, with 23 cities set to use ranked choice voting this November. Virginia Republicans successfully just used RCV to nominate their candidates for governor and other statewide office. And RCV won big on the ballot in two more cities. Um, it's won in over 10 straight cities by more than an average of 30 percentage points. And RCV legislation was introduced in 29 states. Coming up, New York City will use RCV in all its big primary elections on June 22nd, including for mayor. It's already getting huge attention, and I suspect RCV may never have been in the nation's spotlight as much it will in just these coming weeks. We're going to start today with my colleagues, Colin Pitts and Angela um, Calders interviewing Congressman Richie Torres from, from New York. Um, Khaled joined Fairbo last year as executive VP for policy and programs after two decades of impactful work for change. And Angela is our new government affairs director after a career that includes stints as chief of staff for three members of Congress. Um, Khaled, let me turn it over to you to, to introduce the Congressman. Thanks, Rob. Um, just checking to see if has a Congressman joined us yet. He has not. <laughs> so in, in Zoom world, uh, it's sometimes a little harder to sort of organize these, these calls, particularly with the congressman's uh, schedule with votes and other things. Um, so we have uh, a, a, a change in, in scheduling just in case this might happen, because we're always prepared like a Mountie. Uh, Rob, I'm going to turn it back to Rob, because we've got a video that we want to show you. Oh, thanks, Colin. You know what we could do is have this this conversation that you and Sangita and I were going to have about fair vote. Um, and um, when and you know what though, I might do just so the congressman has probably heard about himself before. You could just make sure people know who he is, and then when he comes on, we could sort of jump right into the conversation. So why don't you say a few words about Congressman Torres, and then we'll sort of talk about where fair vote is and its trajectory. Sure. Um, Congressman Richie Torres, uh, he's a rising up and comer uh, on, the, uh, in, in the, on the House side. He's a representative from New York's 15th district in the South Bronx. He spent his entire life, you know, working for the community he calls home. In 2013, at the young, age of 25, Representative Torres became New York City's youngest elected official and the first openly LGBTQ person elected to office in the Bronx. Uh, he's a member of the Committee on Financial Services, and he serves as the vice chair of the Committee on Homeland Security. You know, particularly relevant to today's conversation with all that's going on, he has been very active in educating voters about ranked choice voting in New York City's June primaries. And in fact, he introduced a successful amendment to HR1 related to ranked choice voting. So when the congressman joins us, we're going to be so excited to talk to him about his history. And as I speak... <laughs> uh, Congressman Torres just joined us. Thank you for joining, uh, joining us, Congress Torres. We just gave a brief bio, uh, a little bit of your background, which I assume you know about yourself already. So 
uh, we won't have to go right to it. So I just want to start off with knowing your schedule. Thank you again for joining us. You know, with so much going on in our world and the work you and your fellow colleagues are focused on to help our towns and, and cities safely reopen, you know, it's, you know, you being here is much appreciated. And as an election reform organization, we are certainly interested in the work of Congress in this space, particularly when it comes to voting reforms like ranked choice voting. So can you tell us first, you know, the audience here, how you first came to support ranked choice voting and, and what do you think it, may, it may, why do you think it makes sense for New York City? I came to support uh, ranked choice voting in the context of, of New York City. So we had a referendum in 2019, um, establishing ranked choice voting as a standard in New York City elections, uh, which won uh, two thirds of support from the New York City electorate. And, and for me, ranked choice voting is a much more accurate expression uh, of the will of the people. Uh, it, it makes our elections far more democratic because it fundamentally ensures that no one can win an elected office without ultimately winning a majority of the vote. That's, you know, that's so true. You know, uh, many may not know that ranked choice voting, or sometimes we'll refer to it as RCV here in shorthand, you know, earned the support of New York City's Charter Commission and that when it came to the ballot, 70% of voters supported it in 2019. Um, we're experiencing right now, both voters and, 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 and those who are running for office. What has been your experience with introducing RCV to your constituents? You know, there are critics of RCV who claim that it's, it's too complicated, it's too cumbersome. Uh, but the reaction I've heard from voters is quite the opposite, is, is I think people appreciate a method of voting that is every bit as three-dimensional as people. Uh, you know, it's never the case that we have, you know, a binary mindset when voting for candidates. It's not as if we only support one candidate and we oppose everyone else. We have varying degrees of support for, for multiple candidates and the ability to express uh, those varying preferences through ranked choice voting has been well received by the voters in my district and elsewhere in New York City. Excellent. Well, Congressman, uh, let me pick up a little bit on your time in the House of Representatives. Um, you've just turned 33, but you've already served eight years on the New York City Council, and then you won your open seat for Congress last year. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what public service means to you and how the move to Congress has is, is been going so far? Well, my experience so far in Congress is much more eventful than I possibly could have imagined. Um, you know, I was born and raised in the Bronx. I grew up in poverty most of my life. So the experience of going to DC is surreal and shocking on its own. Uh, but if anyone had said to me that I would become a member of Congress during an infectious disease outbreak and then witness an insurrection against the US Capitol and then vote to impeach an outgoing president and all of that would happen within the first two weeks, I would have said, it sounds like a movie. It sounds like fantasy. So it's been much more dramatic than, than I possibly could have imagined. But uh, it's deeply gratifying uh, to be in Congress. You can do an enormous amount of good for an enormous number of people. And I feel like Congress is a natural progression from local government. Um, you know, I spent seven years in the city council and I came to realize that there was a limit to what I could do at the local level uh, because much of what is done locally is the administration of federal programs and priorities. And I came to realize if I wanna be a transformational policymaker, I have to be in Washington, D.C., because that's where the rules are set. That's where the purse strings are held. Uh, that's where the trajectory of the country is largely determined. Uh, and so I feel like I have benefited enormously from my experience as, as a former city council member because I have an on the ground knowledge of how federal policies operate at the local level. Couldn't be. That's very, very true. And so it's true, of ranked, it's true of ranked choice voting, like my, my experience of ranked choice voting in New York City has informed my advocacy at the federal level. Absolutely. So HR1 is the major electoral reform package that's already passed uh, the House of Representatives and has moved over to the Senate. You know, Congressman Raskin helped ensure that a pro ranked choice voting measure relating to voting equipment was included, but you also successfully introduced an amendment to HR1 that calls for the US Government Accountability Office to study how ranked choice voting impacts voter turnout, negative campaigning, and who decides to run for office. Could you say a little bit more about that measure and what you hope it uh, leads to? 
Yeah, so I, I included within HR1 an amendment that requires the Government Accountability Office to study ranked choice voting and particularly the impact it has on voter turnout, uh, the diversity of those running for public office, um, the tone of campaigning, negative campaigning. And you know, the purpose here is to raise greater public awareness about uh, ranked choice voting and, and encourage more states to adopt ranked choice voting when it comes to federal elections. Well, it's interesting, I, and I'm really glad you point out uh, your local experience that, you know, as we look forward to the most uh, important moments for how the nation sees ranked choice voting, you know, happen, particularly in the upcoming primary elections in your hometown, New York City, um, you mentioned about how candidates engage with it. Can you share your thoughts of how you feel candidates have experienced RCV in its implementation in, in this primary? For example, uh, do you feel RCV has affected how candidates uh, have, how have they campaigned or engaged with voters? No question, you know, ranked choice voting not only changes the way we vote, it also changes the way we campaign. Um, you know, instead of catering to a narrow base, you as a candidate have an incentive to have the greatest amount of appeal to the greatest number of people. Uh, and so it creates a disincentive against negative campaigning. And in some cases, it creates an incentive for collaboration. You, you might collaborate with one of your rivals and, and encourage your voters to rank that person as number two, and then he or she ranks, encourages their supporters to rank you as number two. So it, it promotes a much more collaborative spirit. Uh, it creates a disincentive against negative campaigning. It does not eradicate it entirely, but there is a cost to negative campaigning. If you decide to, to go negative, it can limit your appeal and undermine your ability to do well under ranked choice voting. And then, you know, uh, when, I, when I first ran for public office, I, I, I knocked on thousands of doors and we would rank people on a scale of one to five. And hmm. was strongly for and five was strongly against. And if someone was, you know, you know, three, four, five, you would likely move on, right? You would focus on turning out prime Democrats who were either leaning in your direction or were gonna vote for you. Under ranked choice voting, you have an incentive to communicate with everyone. Because even if you cannot be my first choice, uh, if I cannot be your first choice, I wanna be your second choice. And even if I cannot be your second choice, I wanna be your third choice. So it empowers voters in two senses. Not only does it enable you as a voter to vote for more than one candidate, but it also means that every candidate has an incentive to speak to you. Your vote matters more and it matters to every single candidate. You know, it's some of the things that we've found in our research anecdotally as we analyze more and more right choice voting, you know, elections and seeing how that impact is uh, with candidates and how they campaign. It's, it's always good to hear firsthand from someone who, um, who understands ranked choice voting and those who've actually experienced it to see how this actually plays out. You know, um, aside from the outcome in this primary, what is your biggest hopes? What are your biggest hopes for ranked choice voting and how it works in New York City this spring? And, and would you like to see it extended to more elections throughout the state? Well, I want uh, ranked choice voting to be the standard. Um, you know, HR1, which is the first wave of democracy reforms, uh, includes independent redistricting and campaign finance reform. I hope future waves of, of democracy reform includes ranked choice voting. It should be the standard nationwide. I mean, that should be the ultimate objective. Uh, I'm convinced that ranked choice voting makes our elections more democratic, more decent, more diverse. It empowers voters and most importantly, it disempowers sports. Um, you know, there are candidates who can win under plurality voting, even though a majority of their constituents oppose them. A majority of their constituents might even despise them, but under plurality voting, if you eke out a narrow win on the strength of a narrow base, uh, and if the opposition to you is split, uh, then you elect a majority of people who oppose you. There's something wrong with that system. And the greatest value of ranked choice voting lies in neutralizing the spoiler effect. Well, Congressman, I certainly wanna thank you for the time. I know you've got a lot of things to do, particularly addressing issues to your important to your constituents. I do want to give you the opportunity uh, to speak to the audience here who are maybe perhaps for the first time getting a chance to, to meet you or get introduced to you. If you had anything to say before we, 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 we part what we say goodbye. Uh, no, I just want to thank you for the work you do for me. Um, 
nothing is more foundational than ensuring that our democracy works and that it properly and fully expresses the will of the people. And, and so proud to be a partner in, in, in advancing the cause of more democratic elections. Well, we look forward to the, the work, underlying the work works. You know, we look forward to working with you uh, today, tomorrow, and into the future uh, as we advance issues of reform to make our uh, elections better uh, and make this union a more perfect union. So thank you very much for your time, uh, Congressman. Take care. Thank you. Well, Angela, it's, it is certainly exciting to have new allies in, in Congress like Congressman Torres. And uh, speaking of new, as you sell into your role here at Fair Vote, what is what are you looking for particularly? What's looking particularly promising to you? Yeah, you know, you know, for starters with Fair Vote, I'm particularly excited to build out our government affairs department and, and work with both sides of the aisle as we advance our legislative priorities and really broaden our relationships. Um, even with COVID restrictions, you know, I think we're engaging with federal and state legislators on our issues more than ever because a lot of people are working remote. It's easy to communicate. Uh, and I feel that that is already paying off. You know, more than 20 cities in Utah have decided to use ranked choice voting in their next elections. And the Virginia Republican Party had delegates use RCV ballots in its primary just last week. Um, you know, in Congress, we're working closely with allies on the upcoming reintroduction of the Fair Representation Act. Um, we have a couple, number of briefings that are scheduled and are, are upcoming. Uh, and we're regularly having conversations with new congressional staff and working with on in introducing fair vote and working with new members and bringing new champions uh, on board. You know, part of that is, you know, that's why fair vote is actually creating a much bigger role for fair vote action, um, which can focus 100% on lobbying and winning the day, winning what we're trying to achieve. Um, and the next year, we really want to see legislative we support in Congress actually passed into law. We want to engage with both major parties about greatly expanding the use of ranked choice voting in presidential primaries. We want to take the national reform models and help our state allies pass them where it makes sense. And favorite action is really going to help us accomplish those objectives. Well, Angela, you certainly uh, have a lot on your plate and you're working on. So much appreciation for your time today. Let's bring Rob back into the conversation as we continue uh, uh, this webinar. Thanks, Colin. <clears throat> wow, I was really impressed with the congressman. I, I, in fact, I might even add a T to my last name now, now that uh, I see what a Richie can really be. <laughs> but um, we're now gonna be joined by our fellow executive team member, Sankita Sigdal, uh, who's in her third year now at Fairboat and has many years experienced though before, um, helping organizations grow and scale and why we've been so fortunate to have her with us. Um, before going to our segment on the, the big news uh, of the month uh, out of Utah for ranked choice voting, I wanted to have Sangeeta and Khaled share a little more about why this is a big, important time for Fair Vote. And Sangeeta, let's start with you. Um, tell us a little bit more about your history with growing organizations and what lessons that has for Fair Vote. Thank you, Rob, uh, for the opportunity to talk about Fair Vote as a whole and what we have done together in the last two and a half years. Um, I came to Fair Vote from the international development field where I was involved in scaling organizations that served as central platforms and the voice for various movements. Examples are the microfinance and global anti-poverty movement in the mid 2000s and good governance, transparency and accountability movement in the last five to seven years. Um, so when I came to Fair Vote in 2019, I was relatively new to the US democracy field. And I found in Fair Vote an organization that was on the cusp of doing great things and had unique solutions to the root causes of hyperpolarization and government dysfunction we see in our time. And it was also clear to me that we needed to approach the opportunity in a holistic manner for our long-term success. What do I mean by that? We used a framework with four key elements to advance our work since 2019. The four elements of the framework are program design, which defines the mission and programmatic objectives, systems and processes, culture and leadership and governance. To repeat again, that's program design, systems and processes, culture and leadership and governance. 
as a way to bring into focus all areas of the organization that need to be in sync for our mission to succeed and for our programmatic outcomes to impact change in our society and government as a whole. The initial step was to launch a four-year strategic planning process in 2019 and to outline our longer term plans for systems and structural reforms. I would say this was the most important step for Fair Road and which has enabled our staff team and our partners in the larger ecosystem to rally around our strategy and policy solutions. So Khalid and you know, our communications director and Angela, their hiring was very much shaped by the strategic plan you know, that we, we laid out. The plan also anchored us in how we build our team to ensure we have the resources needed to execute our strategy and to ensure we meet our long-term goals. So in other words, we're following a methodical way to scale. And the process of outlining our strategy and cohering around that was one of the most important steps, followed by building other aspects of Fair Vote to ensure all four elements were working together. For example, we have upgraded our internal systems and processes to build a professional and efficient operations. We are building a culture that enables everyone to collaborate and succeed. And finally, to ensure that leadership as a whole, including board governance and staff leadership are at the level where our strategy and long-term objectives can become reality. It's really been a great process and you know, it's not easy to make these big changes, but we've landed in an exciting place. Um, one important element of our planning was to reaffirm our commitment to working with people um, from across the spectrum. And I know Democrats in your hometown there of Arlington, Virginia, across the Potomac are, are leading on using righteous voting um, in their own elections, but even as more than 30,000 Virginia Republicans just successfully used RCV at their unassembled convention uh, for their statewide nominations. Tell us uh, more about why working across the spectrum is important. Uh, that's a great question, Rob. I'm actually part of, in my uh, private citizen hat, I sit on a task force that's uh, trying to bring ranked choice voting to Arlington, Virginia. Um, so, uh, you know, Having a nonpartisan stance is something I've deeply appreciated working at Fair Vote. It's not easy um, to do so in politics and in general these days. We not only believe in better elections at Fair Vote and fair representation for all, but we walk that talk every day, even with growing tension between the major parties and the deeply disturbing tendency for partisans to define the value of voting rules on how much they help their side, like partisan gerrymandering and establishing unnecessary barriers to Americans exercising their right to vote. But we know from our experience that ranked choice voting can win everywhere. We'll hear more about Utah shortly as, as Rob mentioned, but I've experienced it right here in Arlington. I live in very blue Arlington where Democrats have used uh, ranked choice voting for their own elections for a decade and are now poised to establish it in all county elections. Yet, it was the Republican Party of Virginia that was the first to use it statewide. They just had a successful unassembled convention with more than 30,000 delegates casting RCV ballots to nominate their candidate. So it underscores the point that RCV is a common sense solution for all, whether you're a lawmaker in Texas, Maryland, or Congress, or, or Kansas, or in Congress, Longer term, there's every reason to believe that we can bring leaders in both parties together in support of the Fair Representation Act. We all suffer when the People's House doesn't represent all of us or function as it was intended. Democrats in rural Oklahoma need a voice in Congress just as much as Republicans in Chicago and New York City do. We know the path to a shared movement for reform is challenging, but we're deeply committed to it. Thanks, Angita. Very well said. And um, I'm going to go to college. Khaled, you've now been at Fairvote for over a year. Um, I think you've seen a, maybe a handful of your colleagues, colleagues in a person during this whole time, given the challenges represented by, the, by COVID-19. But as you look forward and as we begin to come together more in person, but also just collectively and in, in, in service of our mission, what would be success for you and the, the program team at Fairvote? Well, thanks, Rob. You know, you know, earlier, Angela laid out some of the exciting work of the government affairs team. But like other historical movements, you know, some of which I've been directly involved with, whether it's gun control or health care, to win big on our reforms, we need to build a diverse coalition of supporters. 
and shape the public narrative around our reforms. Part of that will be leaning into our strength, strength sorry, and, and, and history and, and helping the growing number of, of state and local groups advancing RCV directly and by connecting with them uh, and connecting them with one another. You know, part of that is continue, continuing the work of building a consensus among thought leaders of the imperative of changing our elections to make our country stronger uh, and make our elections better. You know, I'm, um, I'm particularly excited about a few things that the benefits we are going to gain from the process. And just to highlight a few, you know, the constituency-based constituency thought leader tables we are developing are going to allow us to dig deep and understand how our reforms impact different communities. Not only electoral reforms, but the major constituencies that move things in our politics, like business and labor uh, and the faith community. Uh, you know, the work of our partnerships team and their work supporting the collective RCV community will allow us to continue to share information and best practices within our community, helping lift all boats as the waters of capacity rise across the country. And through our research and the conversations we're having with organizations and leaders outside our reform community, we're going to be better equipped to not only develop better messaging practices, but inform the environment in which the narrative is set among thought leaders, whether they be an elected official, a leading, a leading thinker in academia, or journalists and editorial boards across our country. I agree. It's a great time to think big, act smart, expand our winning. I'm looking forward to it. So now I'm going to, to, to play a recording. It was taped last week, just a day after it was made official, that fully 23 cities in Utah had decided to use ranked choice voting this fall. Acts of the city council. So it wasn't imposed on them. That was their choice. Um, as you watch, please add any questions you have, as mentioned at the start, to the Q&A section of Zoom. We'll, we'll be going through them, answering some privately, and then some when we're back live. Colin and I are going to be joined by our senior research analyst, Deb Otis, uh, to do our best to answer them. So what's going on in Utah really is remarkable, and I'm so pleased that I had the chance to talk um, with Mark Roberts, Rebecca chavez Halk, and Taylor Morgan. Uh, his background, uh, Mark graduated from Brigham Young and is a successful businessman. He was elected to the Utah State Legislature back in 2012. Um, during his time in office, Mark served on the Business and Labor Committee and is chair of the Government uh, Operations Committee, which oversees elections in the state. He owns and operates a payment technology company and lives in Salem, Utah with his wife and five kids. A Republican, he co-sponsored a successful bipartisan ranked choice voting pilot project bill with Rebecca chavez Alp, a Democrat. And a graduate of Utah, uh, University of Utah, Rebecca uh, represented Salt Lake City in the Utah House for a decade, focusing primarily on public policy relating to health and human services, as well as voter engagement and access. She now provides leadership coaching and community engagement consulting through her public affairs firm when she's not volunteering to try to expand voting in cities in Utah. Uh, a volunteer, uh, a founding partner of Morgan May Public Affairs, Taylor Morgan has advised numerous municipal, legislative, and federal candidates and campaigns affiliated with both major political parties. Since 2013, Taylor has served as executive director of the Count My Vote Citizens Campaign and chief consultants for its related political and policy activities to modernize elections and increase voter turnout in Utah. He's a consultant to Utah Ranked Choice Voting. I'm going to turn it um, over to uh, Ashley, our, our, our intrepid communications director, who's going to share our interview, um, which should be starting in moments. Uh, Rebecca, Mark, and Taylor. We're recording this on uh, May 11th, just a day after the news that 23 Utah cities have signed up to use ranked choice voting this November for city elections, from the largest city in the state, Salt Lake, to small towns um, in, in different parts of the, the, the state. This comes just four years after I got to know Mark and Rebecca in their roles as leading champions of ranked choice voting in the state legislature, and barely a year after the launch of Utah RCB. Let me start with you, Rebecca. Tell me a little bit more about how you got interested in ranked choice voting and what led you to, uh, to, to, to push the issue back in 2017. Well, actually, I had a constituent that reached out to me all the way back in 2008 when I was first running for the state legislature, who was a great advocate of IRB, is what he called it, and ranked choice voting, instant runoff voting. Um, but I, at the time, I just didn't know whether the time was right, whether people would understand it. 
come uh, 2016, I was seeing this real sense of amongst the, the, the electorate of people wanting to see something else, wanting to have another option, um, particularly in light of the Democratic primary. I'm a Democrat. Um, and folks that really didn't, number one, wanted to necessarily be aligned with the party. They didn't want to be pigeonholed into a little box of being a partisan, but they wanted their voice to count and they wanted their votes to count. And so I revisited what a little bit more about ranked choice voting. And the more that I read about it, I thought, I think now is the time. I think people, the electorate is open to considering is there another way we could do this? Is there another process that might make my voice be heard a bit more ardently? And so I took a chance and ran the bill in 2017 just to test drive it. And it got some really great momentum. And in part, it was because the uh, GOP in our state had been using instant run of voting for their own internal elections. And, and Mark can address that a little bit more. So there was a familiarity in our majority party's understanding of ranked choice voting and how it could be used. I actually, as a Democrat, had to do a lot of introductions to the folks on my side of the aisle about ranked choice voting because they'd never really heard of it and were a little bit apprehensive about this. Um, so that is kind of my first foray and, and, and why I got interested in it. But it was more about really addressing the voters' need and the voters' desire to have their voice heard. Hey Mark, you've been supporting ranked voting for years, uh, elected to the legislature when you were just 30 and uh, one of the sort of younger legislators we find often uh, like, like the idea. Why did you support ranked voting and what did you make of what happened there in 2017? Sure. You know, I've been familiar with ranked choice voting from being in the party, uh, doing things in the, in the especially the Utah County um, Republican Party. Uh, we conducted ranked choice voting conventions and, and caucus meetings. And so I was familiar with it from there. Uh, and as I used it there, I really liked how it worked. I liked it, it allowed us to get to some sort of you know, majority position um, on those who were voting for. And I really liked that it didn't pigeonhole me into you know two choices type of thing, right? I, I could express my preferences. Um, and, uh, you, you know, according to how I wanted, I didn't have to play games of, well, I, I vote here, my vote might split, you know, we're going to split the votes and somebody else might get elected, that type of thing. Uh, so I really liked it from that sense that, you know, as a voter, I could, uh, I, I could better express how I felt about who I wanted to represent me. Um, so that's where I liked it. And honestly, when I got elected and people asked me, hey, what are you going to do? You know, that's one of the things I always ask. What, what's your topics? What bills are you going to run? This was one of the things on my mind was, OK, let's get ranked choice voting in a state somehow. So 2013 was my first session. Learned a lot that session. 2014, I learned some more. And one thing that happened in 2014 was our election laws completely changed in Utah, completely changed. Um, in, in so much that prior to 2014, um, you could only ever have two people on the primary ballot. Uh, 2014 introduced legislation that allowed multiple people to end up on the primary ballots. And I saw that as a good opportunity to then say, well, hey, and, and when that was passed, everybody acknowledged, I think, that that was going to be a problem, having multiple people on the ballot, but nobody really knew or had a plan at the time on how to address it. Well, I had ranked choice voting, and I saw that, because I've been trying to figure out how am I going to introduce this, get my colleagues to like it. When that passed, I, I quickly filed at the end of that, at that session, going into the 2015 session, a ranked choice voting bill as a solution for the plurality issue that now we have in the primaries. Um, ran the bill that year and immediately ran up against the clerks uh, and a huge price tag. And I had no idea what I was doing at the time. I was still learning. It was only my third year in the legislature. Um, I, opposition from the clerks, opposition from the Senate, opposition from everybody. And it was, you know, I, I didn't know Rebecca very well at the time. I didn't know that she was interested in it. And so it was just me, this young, you know, 
legislator trying to do this big, huge reform. And I think I ended up amending the bill a few times and changed things. I, uh, and the thing, the bill that got to the House, I don't even think had ranked choice voting in it at that point, right? Because all the opposition. And then I think the bill failed on the House floor. Uh, so then the next year I saw that Rebecca, um, so the next year I, I filed the bill again, but didn't get anywhere with it that year either, right? And then the next year was 2017. And somehow I got wind that Rebecca was interested in it and that she had the bill filed. And so I said, I reached out and said, hey, why don't you run with it this year? I'll, I'll, I'll help you. You know, I'll, I'll keep pushing it with you. And at first it was just the two of us and, you know, coordinating that way. And I don't remember when or how, but at some point somebody from Fair Vote reached out or somebody from the Great Choice Voting, um, what's it called? Uh, center resource uh, center, uh -huh. resource, center yeah, yeah. resource center reached out and all of a sudden we had some support there all of a sudden you know we're getting other support from from other uh people i can't remember if stan came around that year i think he did um and all of a sudden we had all this support we had some momentum it'd been a few years and we'd had some experience with plurality in the primaries so people were like oh yeah this is a problem this is a real problem we got to fix this we had all also been talking at the state level of, of uh, this. So one of the reasons I took a break in 2016, I think, was because the, the voting equipment. That was one of the biggest things is, is the current voting equipment didn't support it. Well, the state was entering in some new RFPs for new voting equipment. And so that was all lining up. So a bunch of things were just lining up where in 2017 we were ready. Right. And we've been talking about it long enough. Rebecca had been talking about with the Democrat the colleagues I've been talking about, we're familiar with it. We now had support from Fair Vote and Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center and Stan and, and Corey was there helping out and, and you know, various other people. And, and the House has always been a big support of this. It sailed through the House, the bill did. It was awesome. Um, uh, it got through the House. And, and it was a vote away from getting out of committee in the Senate. And, you know, if it wasn't for the clerks that came in and just put, you know, the fear of God into everybody about this like they do, I think it would have passed the, the committee in the Senate. So um, anyway, that's kind of what I make in 2017. Just like Rebecca said, a lot of things just aligned that year where we all of a sudden got a lot of momentum to do something. Yeah, it was really exciting to see just to take off and 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 you know again this big bipartisan work that was 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 moving and you know a legislature on the cusp of, of passing it for all the big elections in Utah. So Stan Lockhart got involved at the that at uh, more involved that year. Former Republican Party chair, good connections in the Senate, um, and and Stan and you all developed kind of a slower approach. Right, and that's sort of what then pivoted to 2018. And um, tell us a little bit more about that kind of shift to a local option bill um, and how that, was that still a fight to get that and kind of lessons lessons from that that kind of change to a, to a, to a, to a more incremental strategy? Maybe we'll start with you, Mark. Yeah, uh, in 2017, Rebecca's bill, the bill we ran that year, it was the whole thing, right? We were, we were going for everything. Um, RCV in the general election. Uh, and, you know, we got the pushback, the typical pushback from the clerks. This is too hard to do. People aren't going to figure out, you know, and, and all kinds of things. So somehow we just decided, look, let's, I, I think we had, I don't know how many iterations of what we wanted to do that year, but we ended up with, let's take a step back we're getting pushed back. People are telling us it's not going to work. Let's let's try it out. I think Rob, maybe you suggested this at one point. Possibly is is something that people have done other places. But let's try it out at the municipal level, nonpartisan races, and make it an option. And we thought if we make it an option, we're not forcing it on anybody. That way, the clerks maybe will take a step back, and they kind of agreed to take a step back at that point. And, and then we can try it out at local levels and really, you know see if the claims the clerks are making are valid or not. 
And, you know, that's kind of how we ended up with, with that bill in 2018 and the legislature supported it and, and we passed it. Yeah, and that was that, that was an exciting next step. Of course, it wasn't over then. Um, so now you had to get cities to persuade it to 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 actually act on it, and the clerks, of course, fighting you along the way. One thing I wanted to to turn to Rebecca for again is is the fact that you and Mark worked well together, and this has been a kind of a bipartisan proposal with these weekly calls that you two have done. Probably, you know, the great majority of every week in the last four years or something on ranked choice voting. Say a little bit more, Rebecca, about kind of uh, um, what, how that, how that was for you, and 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 sort of lessons for how this can be an issue that that doesn't need to divide parties in in other states. Well, I think one of the things that I would share as an underpinning to all of this is that you know Utah folks may know is a supermajority party, an ultra supermajority party, with the Republicans being in the in the in the majority. And we as Democrats, we have to find the Republicans to work with if we want to get legislation passed. That's just the reality of our situation. And so, you know, um, I have been working on elections reform uh, legislation since I got into office. So a good portion of the eight to nine years that I was in office, I was in office for 10 years. I've been working on election, um, election reform. Uh, my election day voter registration uh, program uh, which was finally passed in my last year in 2018, started out as a pilot. And I knew that pilot programs often um, worked really successfully because they uh, give time for people to test things out, you know, and for us to, to work out the kinks. I mean, sometimes things don't work and you learn along the way with a pilot program. And so I knew, you know, when we started in jumping into this endeavor related to a municipal pilot, I thought it would be successful because it does allow you to kind of test the waters. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, for our Democrats, this was really new. I mean, I think that the Republicans, since they were familiar with uh, ranked choice voting, were a bit more comfortable with it. And I think that's why we started with this 2017 successful momentum there. But I, I, I continue, and I still continue in some cases with our old guard in our party have to do some convincing because they're comfortable at some level with the status quo. Change is challenging. Um, but really to pass anything in the state legislature for us as Democrats, we do have to be Republican support. So I always try to make things as bipartisan as I possibly can and enter into conversation with folks across the aisle. But we did have this very unique perfect storm for us, I believe, here in Utah, where you have the Republican Party that had already been using instant runoff voting in their intra-party elections. That is very different, I believe, from most other states. Um, you usually have the reverse, where the, the Democrats are pushing for ranked choice voting, and the Republicans are saying, what is this newfangled thing that you're bringing in front of us? Um, and it was kind of the reverse here in Utah. But I believe because I had been working on elections reform for the you know six, eight years previously, with my caucus and for those that I was trying to persuade on the left side of the aisle, they knew that I would be, would, wouldn't be working on something in elections reform if I, I didn't feel that it had been tested well and that if I didn't believe it was in the best interest of the voter. So I think that having had my experience working in elections reform, that, that confidence was there on the part of the folks on my side of the aisle. And then Mark really just had to say, you know, why why not? We've been using this previously. And in in light of the concerns that the GOP had with plurality, it really was an elegant solution to deal with some of the concerns that they had since we had this signature path to allow candidates to get on the ballot. Yeah. And, and Rob, maybe yeah. if I add something to that from the bipartisan's perspective, at the end of the day, you know, elected officials it's interesting, right? Because you have elected officials voting about a measure that that could change or affect their ability to get elected or not, right? And so it, it puts an interesting dynamic there. And what I've always enjoyed about Rebecca is I feel like um, she, she's been very honest with with herself and the voting and 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 just saying, hey, what is the best method for the voter? for the people, not necessarily for me, but for the voter. What, what works the best for the voter? And, and as elected officials, that's where I think we need to get in the mindset. And I think Rebecca and I have been able to work well that way because we both had that mindset of, at the end of the day, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, what is the best method for the voter? 
and I truly believe this is the best method. Um, it, well, it's much better than the current plurality. Yeah. Situation. There, there we go. Yeah. So, yeah, per perfection is illusory. So, yeah. I'm gonna get Taylor into this conversation. Uh, Taylor, you uh, um, uh, played a huge role with with what's been going on the last couple of years. So, ranked voting got a couple of key city wins. Uh, Amelia Powers Gardner, a clerk, played a huge role in that. Um, and then, so there was oh, what next? And that's where sort of Utah RCV um, really started to build on that. Tell us a little bit more about how you you got involved in your your history of work on reform in Utah. Well, thank you. I have been involved in Utah election uh, reform, if you will, uh, for far too long. Actually, I was just thinking about this, and I first really met and started working with Rebecca, then Representative uh, Chavez Hauk, back in 2009. Uh, when I staffed the Governor's Commission on Strengthening Utah's Democracy. That was a commission that was uh, formed by former Utah Governor John Huntsman Jr. Uh, back in 2008. And we came together with uh, elected officials, with community leaders, to try to look at ways that we could uh, improve and update Utah's election process uh, to be more inclusive and to increase voter participation. So Rebecca has been a champion of election modernization for as long as I have known her. And so that's where my path really started. Um, I worked in the state elections office uh, for a couple of years, and then I got involved with the statewide initiative uh, that expanded uh, primary elections in Utah that allowed candidates uh, to have a uh, separate signature nomination path to the primary election ballot. That was passed by the legislature in 2014. Uh, and then uh, Mark's 2015 ranked choice voting bill scared, just scared me to death. I didn't know what ranked choice voting was. I didn't understand it. Uh, at the time, I thought Mark was trying to meddle with uh, the process we had just changed. But come to find out, uh, ranked choice voting, as he explained, uh, is the perfect solution to fix the issues with the plurality ballot with multiple candidates. And, and as I learned more about ranked choice, I realized it was the perfect solution in Utah, and it was exactly what we needed uh, to solve the issue of runoffs uh, in our state and in our primaries. And so it's been a real exciting opportunity for me to get involved with uh, helping to expand the ranked choice voting pilot program for cities. Uh, the 2019 elections in Payson and Vineyard here uh, really intrigued me, uh, how smoothly they went, uh, how much the voters loved ranked choice in those cities, how much the candidates also liked ranked choice. It was overwhelming. Voters and candidates, we're talking nearly 90% of both voters and candidates who use ranked choice in those cities loved it. And they wanted it not only used again in their cities, but they like it so much they wanted it expanded and used in all elections in Utah. And so that really caught my attention in 2019. Uh, and then I, I reached out to Stan Lockhart and connected with him. I really had to be a part of this, uh, Rob. I've been involved with so many major election uh, updates in Utah over the last decade that clearly ranked choice voting was the next uh, most significant step to improve Utah's elections. Um, and I, I want to give a hat tip to Rebecca and Mark both for what they have done over the years as legislators. And they're both no longer legislators. They, are, they were citizen servants for years. And as Rebecca, one of the most progressive, and Mark, one of the most conservative members of our legislature, the fact that they would come together on this, on ranked choice voting, to me, really indicates how important and meaningful this cause is here in Utah. Yeah, no, it's been, that's been an impressive part of this for me. And um, so there you are, you know, two cities, and I, I agree, Pace and Vineyard seem to go ter terrifically well. So now more cities can do it. The legislature continues to be helpful in little ways to, 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 to keep, keep, uh, keep supporting the pilot. Um, but as you started 2021, um, I assume you weren't expecting 23 cities to, to get involved. And so, so what happened this year what are some of the stories that sort of stand out for you about sort of how, how this happened? And I guess maybe in, in, include in that sort of now what, right? Now you've got 23 cities. Right? 
Well, to be honest, Rob, I think we're all very thrilled that we have 23 cities. But to be honest with you, I think it's so obvious and ranked choice voting is just such a perfect tool for cities. I'm still a little disappointed that all 250 didn't decide to use it. Um, we'll get them there, right? But we have 23. Uh, again, like you said, we have our state's largest city in Salt Lake City. Uh, we have very small cities uh, that are in some very rural uh, counties in our state. So it's, a, it's an incredible mix. Uh, we're really excited to, to helping them implement those elections, to working with the county clerks. Um, the future for ranked choice voting in Utah is sky, the sky is the limit, really. There are all kinds of uh, applications and opportunities. Uh, and as voter, voters get familiar with the process in these 23 cities, uh, I have no doubt that that'll lead to ranked choice voting being used across the state. Well, Rebecca, I know you had a special uh, role in helping uh, uh, folks you know in Salt Lake City um, move to ranked choice voting. I wasn't sure if you had any stories to tell there, but also you know joining Taylor in 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 mulling you know what's next and what you think could um, could be the, the 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 path forward for ranked choice voting in in, in Utah. Yeah, so as you know, Mark, and we have all mentioned, we've had those various barriers that get in the way as we try to move something like this along. And, you know, we've had challenges with the clerks. And then recently, we were vetting this in front of a number of city council members. There were city council members that were somewhat hesitant, and it kind of addresses or it goes to the point that Mark brought up is when you think about something that might affect your own campaign, you're kind of like, oh, wait, wait a minute, I got to think this through the lens of my own experience. But what made a difference this year, I believe, in a large part, was the constituents that were contacting those council members that were showing up for those council meetings online and that were testifying. And I know in particular with Salt Lake City, we had a, a few constituents that showed up on the day of the vote and they were just adamant to have about how strongly they wanted this option. And I think that especially at a city council level, when you have those constituents showing up, and articulating their demand and their desire that that goes such a long way. Um, so what I would say for those of you that were a part of that, thank you, thank you, thank you. And for those and going forward, um, everybody in all of the cities that are a part of this and for the ones that didn't even participate, we, we need you watching and, and keeping an eye on this. You need to continue to educate and inform, not so much now the city council members, but your fellow uh, neighbors and, and fellow voters so that they know what to expect. Right now, we're gonna move into this, this new phase of education and informing, which we're all excited to do. And we really, but we really need everyone that's an advocate for RCB to help this to educate and inform um, because that's the one thing about pilots. You know, it's, you know, trying to get everybody up to speed, learning from the process. It is my hope at Salt Lake City, now that we've taken this first step and we're hoping for a positive outcome that hopefully will result in an increased voter participation and increased voter engagement so that we can leap into the mayoral election two years from now without hesitancy and implementing a general election for the mayor's race in 2023 again, without hesitation and going straight to that general election. That is my hope. And we have a lot of work along the way to make sure that this year is successful with this test drive to assure that that happens. That's great. And uh, so Mark, I'm going to give the last word to you. Um, what do you, what do you think is the next for ranked choice voting in Utah and any advice for, for people trying to do this elsewhere? No, I think the next step is continue continue to expand on the number of cities that are using it. Um, Taylor and Stan and the team do an awesome job. We wouldn't be here without those guys. Um, but then from there, really keep pushing within the legislature. I think there's a real chance to uh, get some sort of ranked choice voting bill passed for primary elections and or the general election in Utah. I would really love to see it at the general election. I, you know, that's my ultimate goal someday to be able to use ranked choice voting in the general election in Utah. Um, but you know, like we've been doing all along, baby steps to get there. But we saw some movement on that this year. Um, Taylor knows about that. I think we're close, um, and we could possibly see that um, in the next year or two here. 
Um, for others, you know, if, if you have legislative champions for it, I think that obviously helps. And then you get the grassroots and you, you, you can attack it from both angles. Um, but certainly it can't be done without grassroots supporters. Um, emailing, calling, talking to their um, elected officials, both you know at every level, explain to them how it works, let them know they like it, they're comfortable with it. You know, this is one of those types of things that doesn't get done without that type of support. Well, that's a nice message for all of us. And again, congratulations. Uh, this Utah story is something for whatever role Fair Vote has played, I couldn't be prouder of. of, of of being being a, a, a small part of what you've done. So thank you, and um, um, we'll see what comes next. Thanks, Rob. So uh, welcome back. Um, that really was a fun conversation, um, and I uh, hope people enjoyed that too. Uh, we're going to close with answering some questions that have come up today. Um, actually, it was just. Uh, uh, while listening, typing various answers. So if you uh, don't see your question anymore in the live kind of questions, it is in that sort of answered section. And I think Deb has been doing that as well. Um, so um, I'm joined uh, not only by colleague, but by Deb Otis. Uh, Deb is our senior research analyst. She's been a board member of Voter Choice Massachusetts and done some great volunteer work uh, advancing RCV there and a leader with us in doing some, some reports this year on not just strangers voting, but on statewide recounts, uh, competition in congressional elections, faithless electors, the impact of ranked choice voting on communities of color. We're gonna take a, a look at uh, answering some of your questions live uh, so you can keep them coming. Uh, we won't make this an endless event, but we will uh, uh, do, a, do a little of this. And before we get into those questions, I wanted to actually give Deb a chance to um, just comment on you know what, what you're looking forward to researching uh, coming up and, and, and what people can look forward to coming out of your, your team. Thanks, Rob. Uh, we have a lot of exciting research to do on ranked choice outcomes, especially with all of these new implementations, like the 50 ranked choice elections coming out of New York City this summer, and then these 23 Utah cities in November, along with all of the standard RCV elections that we're used to seeing from California and other, other states across the country. So one of the things we'll be looking into is how is ranked choice voting working out in these new RCV cities? So we'll be really looking closely at New York. How are voters using the ballot? We've seen some really strong indications there already from the, their uh, first four special elections which used RCV this spring. We saw voters overwhelmingly understanding how to use the ballot, saying that RCV was simple and that they liked ranked choice voting. So we'll be looking to see if those trends continue and we're expecting great things uh, this summer. In addition, uh, we are looking forward to doing some more analysis on multi-member districts that are in the Fair Representation Act. With new reapportionment coming out based on new census numbers, uh, the congressional numbers will be changing in a number of states and we'll be working on preparing uh, fair representation maps. So our, our suggestions for ways that states could better draw their districts with multi-member districts. And we'll be highlighting the ways that this will improve representation for women and for communities of color and for all sorts of underrepresented groups. It's a big year, so lots to be doing. And uh, why don't we, um, I'm looking through the questions here, seeing who might be ready. Anyone can sort of look at the chat here and just jump in, but why don't we start with um, one from Bob Braschetto. He's a, a Texan. We've actually worked with some for, uh, gosh, more than 20 years where he was doing some uh, uh, exit survey work on cumulative voting in Texas and has a history of working on voting rights. Um, and his question, which is there in chat, sort of raises the issue of, um, you know, the impact of voting reforms, ranked choice voting, the Fair Representation Act on people of color um, and you know how we're making that case. And I know, uh, Deb, your team just did that big report last week. And I'm wondering, you know, just sort of your top level uh, answers to that, and how you can imagine sort of the next things that that we might want to look into to address those kinds of questions. This is a great question, and it gets at the, a key area of work for us over the next few years. 
Uh, our recent research has shown the way that single winner ranked choice voting benefits communities of color, helping candidates of color, and we're seeing voters of color uh, with strong ballot use. Uh, and so this question gets at how multi-member districts uh, with ranked choice voting are going to improve representation. We do have a number of states in the US that already use multi-member districts for their state legislatures. These folks are not using RCV, but they do have multi-member districts. So we can look, we can uh, get a preview of what kind of results we could get out of those. And we're already seeing, for example, very strong results for women candidates in places that use multi-member districts. And so as we look forward to the Fair Representation Act, uh, as the, uh, the person asked in this question, yes, it will remove the problem of gerrymandering, uh, but it can also have these impacts uh, on minority representation. A big benefit is that ranked choice voting in multi-member districts lowers the threshold for victory. So if you're electing members, say in a three member district, each of those people needs to get 25% support. And this opens up the field to have more competitive elections and more different voices represented. And we hugely increase the number of districts where voters of color have what we call power to elect, meaning they're over this threshold to be able to elect a candidate of choice. And we'll be doing a lot more research on that and uh, publishing some maps and some statistics later in the year. Terrific. Um and so I'm going to ask a question of um, you. I mean, there's a lot of uh, um, sort of insight and in sort of reflecting the fact there's these different questions about, you know, how, how do how do I get my member of Congress interested in this or, or what are some strategies in Congress? And um, what are some things that people who are, are watching us today can helpfully do as, say, Congressman Don Byer gets the Fair Representation Act um, uh, ready to be introduced and there's different, you know, smaller ranked choice voting bills or other bigger ranked choice voting bills. Just what are what are some thoughts about ways that just uh, people can help as 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 we engage with Congress? Sure. I mean, the first thing people can do is reach out to their their elected representative, um, whether that and that's through staff or office, and just make sure that you're registering your opinion. Um, and then other ways are just to get more involved. You know, as like more campaigns come to cities and states near you and um you know we engage more with members of congress at the grass tops level um really being able to volunteer and be a part of that but as far as reaching members of congress you know you just really want to um first take a, a a crack at just introducing yourself and letting them know the issues that you care about well we hope hope everyone can do that um and um Call it as, as you've been listening in and then looking over the questions, is there anything that sort of uh, springs to mind that, that you would wanna make sure we, we add to the conversation? Well, I think looking at the questions here, I think the thing I've noticed both in, uh, in, this, uh, in this conversation and in terms of questions is the momentum. I, you can feel the momentum that's there. You see the research that sort of uh, either proves or leads to us to continue our thinking that how ranked choice voting it's not one of the things we, as Deb pointed out, the Fair Representation Act, it's not only stops bad things from happening in terms of what happens with gerrymandering, but it encourages good things. It encourages people to engage in the process. And that's something we want. We want to figure out how best people can engage in the process, both whether it's voting or reaching out to the, in our democratic process to their um, local or federal uh, representative. I think I'm ex very excited that that energy is there, that energy is something that we're going to tap into as we continue our conversations, both with grass tops leaders, elected leaders, uh, and groups across the country. One of the things that's been really exciting, uh, you know, given how long I've worked for this, and for a while, you know, we were a big fish in a pretty small pond of like, you know, we thought this was really important, but not as many uh, and others did. And we've really seen this expansion of national groups working on this, state groups working all over. Maybe Sangeeta, as you've um, you know seen the power of working together, you know one of the phrase you often use is uh, uh, this: "We can be greater than the sum of our parts." How does that sort of speak to what you're seeing at Fairvote? Oh, that's a big question. Um, but as I said during my remarks, what I found in Fairvote is this potential to be the voice for RCV 
and um, having the solutions that nobody else had. Um, you know, being a relatively new uh, citizen and a voter, I was uh, pretty disappointed with the fact that I only, I had to pick one candidate, you know, during my elections. So I became interested in fair votes reforms. Um, so I think what I found is that there are many indicators that showed me um, that this movement was ready to go to scale. One of them was, you know, funders coalescing around this idea and um, starting to coordinate with each other. Partners and coalitions uh, starting to talk about this idea and expressing uh, a desire to learn more. Um, thirdly, um, uh, in just our broken politics, uh, it all goes back to hyper-partisanship and, and folks getting elected without majority support. So all of those things, um, you know, at a pretty fundamental level, once they come together, um, our solutions, um, you know, actually offer um, a, a remedy to all that we're experiencing. Yeah. When I, I, as I look at questions, I thought maybe we, I might say this and we'll sort of uh, uh, give anyone a chance to say final thoughts that they might have, but we can wrap things up. But there's a number of questions about Utah. They're kind of relatively specific and then are also um, kind of about the politics of, of winning in a conservative area, progressive area. And, and the thing that is fascinating about Utah, I'll say, and obviously we just heard uh, uh, Mark and Rebecca and Taylor talk about it, but is that it's moving in the blue, the blue cities and the red cities, and it's moving um, sort of on a basic um, uh, opportunity, which is to make the case that the, the slogan often used there is it's faster and it's cheaper and it's better because they're going from two rounds of voting. So the current system that all other Utah cities that aren't using ranked choice voting do is they have an August primary that kind of winnows the field uh, in a nonpartisan contest to a smaller field in November. So it means that candidates have to run several more months. Voters have to kind of look at yard signs a lot more often, um, you know, and, and they have to spend money and, and, um, and, you know, they sometimes get some like weird runoff outcomes where, you know, some candidate who probably should have made the runoff doesn't. And, and uh, so now they kind of get it done in one election, um, not two. It, and the candidates have these new rewards for, for, for reaching out and talking to more voters, that actually earns you support. Um, and that we're finding, or the Utah ranked voting people are finding that that's appealing, you know, across the spectrum. This isn't, that kind of uh, argument is, is something that can win in a Republican area, a Democratic area. Um, and I think speaks to our opportunity, particularly with RCV, um, and I think, but ultimately with our sort of uh, North Star goal of the Fair Representation Act, bringing changing winner take all elections in America, is that you can make the case that better elections are good for all of us. And it, it's a tough one, as, as Sangeeta was addressing earlier, but I think that we're starting to see that more and more. And Utah is a particularly good test case of it, but not the only one. And I think that as, as people kind of engage in their own communities, um, I think they can find that that's true. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I think gives me optimism that we can really succeed in our goals. Um, any parting words that anyone might want to raise? I'll, I'll just offer it up to the, to the group here. If not, thanks for joining us. So this isn't the only time you can engage in fair vote webinars. There's this spring webinar series. Uh, we, we do record these and then share them uh, soon after the original live event. So you can see past webinar ones uh, um, and then you can uh, look at our next one coming up in June. Uh, we're gonna do one on the Fair Representation Act when that gets introduced. So if you go to fairvote.org slash 2021 underscore webinar underscore series. We could paste that into chat, but it's uh, just sort of spring webinar series at Fairvote and you can see what's coming up and what has what has been. And so I um, really appreciate um, all of the Fairvote crew for being here. It was great to hear from Congressman Torres. Look forward to working with him and all of you for uh, uh, listening in.